G'day guys and welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Today you've got Joycey and myself uh, discussing the trade period so far. Trade period, as we all know, is equally the most fun and the most agonizing part of the football calendar. Joyce, how are you, uh, as a football fan, enjoying the trade period so far? Are you the sort of person who like really lives for it or do you kind of hate it? Love the trade period. Always great to see, you know, if your club can can snare a good player from the opposition. This year is a little bit slow though. Mind you, we've still got the second half of the week of the fortnight just to come. So I think we'll see a few more deals start to happen. Yeah, I hope you're right. Because during the working week, um, you know, Trade Room is looking at Instagram for just patches throughout the working day uh, is what gets me through. And it has been... Um, few and far between so far but I think that's kind of typical isn't it like I think it's the case of they kind of wait until lots of the all little deals sort of get done and then everyone's got their picks in place for the big deals to happen but one deal that we well I certainly didn't expect to happen very early on in the piece was the Tim Kelly deal and I'm going to guess and say that's probably going to be the biggest trade so we're recording this Sunday night there's three days left of the trade period but um, Joycey as a Fremantle fan who's quite neutral what were your thoughts on this trade do you think the Eagles overpaid as some are suggesting look I think there's a difference between what you need to pay to get a deal done and what the market value of a player is so if I'm looking at what Kelly's worth purely on a market I'd say to pay two first and two seconds is is to pay too much for Tim Kelly. However, the scenario that the Eagles are in at the moment, they've won a premiership just over 12 months ago now and are competing for more premierships. So I think if they can bring a player in that's going to extend that premiership window by a little bit um, and probably add to the possibility of getting another one, I think you just have to do what you have to do to get the deal done pretty much. So I think Eagles made the right call with that one. Yes, well said. I agree with you. Um, as an Eagles fan, I did go into this trade knowing that the Eagles are generous traders, uh, especially in the last few years. We just like to get the deal done early, uh, which I do see the benefit of. I certainly think we paid way more than we could have. We probably could have let this deal hang uh, up until you know at least the second week and, and probably still... I still would have thought two firsts and a second would have been a good good deal for Geelong. Um, having said that, though, like for where the Eagles are at, I think the best argument someone could make is what would Geelong prefer to have back right now, Tim Kelly or all the draft picks they just got? And I think they would still choose Tim Kelly. So Yeah, um, me too. And the other way to look at it as well is if, say, Tom Lynch hadn't been a free agent last year, would Richmond prefer Tom Lynch or would they prefer all the draft picks West Coast traded? And, you know, Tom Lynch was... I'm not saying Tim Kelly will necessarily win the Eagles a flag, but... Um, when you look at it in terms of West Coast have, you know, a three, maybe a three-year window to win another flag, it probably was the right deal. So moving on to the rest of the trade period, who do you think, generally speaking, um, what are some teams that have done well and have caught your eye, Joyce? Who's, who's going about things the right way? Well, I mean, just mentioning the Tim Kelly deal, you know, you do have to give props to both Geelong and West Coast for getting that done early. West Coast probably a little bit we were probably a little bit scared that if they left it to the second week that things just might not get done. So I'm sure that's why they got the deal done early. So I think those two clubs have done pretty well. You know, it looks like Sydney could do well if they could manage to get the the Joe Danaher trade through. Um, I'm still not entirely sure if that one will actually happen. I've got, an, I've got a feeling it might. I tend to think if a player requests a trade, I think it does happen most of the time. But, you know... What are they going to give up? Essendon had got the right to ask for a pretty decent player back. So it'd be very interesting to see what happens there. Essendon are notoriously really tough traders as well. Adrian, uh, Adrian Dodoro, rather, is like always a real tough nut to crack in that respect. So I got a funny feeling. I don't think that deal will happen, but you make a good point. Generally, when this does happen and a player requests a trade, a trade gets made. So I got a few other teams to add to the list of uh, teams I think are doing well. I'm going to say, I think the Brisbane Lions have actually quietly had a pretty solid trade period so far. Um, nothing really st stand out. You know, they haven't traded any big players in. They've kept their... Well, they got two picks under 21 now because of the Dane Beams trade. But I really think adding Birchall uh, in the loss of Luke Hodge was a really astute pickup for the, you know, sort of like an experienced defender there. And Cam ellis Yolman adds a really big body. We know, you know, we got that real developing sort of Brisbane, young Brisbane midfield. I think he's actually underrated pickup. Even though I know you said like uh, in the group chat the other days, he's going to be an 11-year player at the end of his contract. 
despite just playing 39 games. But, um, you know, he's basically for free for the Lions there. So I think they've done pretty well there. Yeah, no, I've, I've got to agree with you there. They're just bringing in good acquisitions that should keep their, um, their good form just ticking along into 2020. What sort of player do you think Ed Langdon will be for the Demons? What kind of pickup do you think that will be for them? Um, I think he will play a fairly similar role to the one that he played at Fremantle. So I can see him slotting pretty much straight in. And statistical numbers, he's actually one of the best wingmen in the league right now. If he can polish up his ball use a little bit, that will be a super good pickup for the Demons. And I don't think they gave away too much for him. When you think of his age, he's just a, just entering like the prime years of his career so I think that's a pretty good pick up for the Demons yeah well said well said another side that I think uh, has probably we already talked about them a little bit but another side that I think is doing really well is Geelong for the fact that they've stockpiled five picks in the top 37 for where Geelong are at I think they're on the verge they're, they've recognised they're on the verge of a lot of players uh, you know sort of reaching the end of their careers and I feel like Geelong are the sort of team who can nail a draft and just be right back there um, you've got a lot of good young talent and they can really add to it five picks in, in the first two rounds We've seen them do it before in 2001, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hoping they don't, they don't do that again. <laughs> what do you think about Hawthorne picking up Sam Frost and John Patton potentially? Uh, bearing in mind Patton hasn't officially gone through yet. Hawks. That's actually another, another team I was probably going to mention. I think who have had a pr- quietly good trade period as well. Hawks are very good at. I feel like they. You don't often see them bring the elite of the elite in, but they just bring in good, solid players that they know. Um, will do a job, uh, bar maybe Ty Vickery. Uh, no, I think John Patton and Frost, I think they could both be actually pretty good pickups for the Hawthorne uh, footy club. Um, you know, they're both not, not too old, still got plenty of footy left in them. I'm pretty surprised Melbourne were that willing to just let Sam Frost walk out, to be honest. Yeah, I agree with you. I think Melbourne probably internally rate their backline. I feel like, especially with Stephen May coming mm. across, whether or not we all agree with that, I don't know. But perhaps they just felt they were well stocked in that area. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, you know, on paper, Sam Frost and John Patton, you know, I wouldn't really say, oh, they're great signings. However, it is Hawthorne, and like you say, they have a habit of turning these players into absolute gun role players. Um, yeah. And they do, they do need strengthening in their spine. Uh, just looking at their list, so um, to have those players in, and they're going to have a pick eleven at the moment. We haven't seen Hawthorne take a pick that early in a long time. So, um, yeah, I think they'll be fairly comfortable with how they've gone. And look at what they're giving up as well to get those players. Not too much at all. On the flip side of it, Joycey, uh, is there anyone you're looking at in this trade period that you don't think's going too well or you don't really like how they're going about it and you don't have to give an answer here? To be honest, I would like to have thought Fremantle would actually be on the front foot a little bit more. Before the trade period, I probably thought we could have got a little bit more out of the Ed Langdon trade, knowing now that St Kilda have traded away that pick six makes things pretty difficult for Fremantle, I think. Peter Bell is going to have to work a little bit of magic, I think, to to turn this into a positive draft period for Fremantle, a uh, trade period for Fremantle. But, you know, it, there's still three days to go, so anything could happen there, and we could be on Wednesday night saying that He's worked some magic again. Yeah, you're right. That's actually a good pickup. I uh, I think Fremantle have done well. They've been astute traders in the last couple of years. They've landed a lot of trade targets. And even when players have wanted to leave, like Weller uh, in particular and Lockie Neal, um, they've turned it into a bit of a plus mm. for the club. So yeah. it's like you say, it's a bit surprising that it doesn't appear to have happened yet. Uh, Fremantle yeah. do so. It doesn't really seem to be going to plan A, whatever the plan A is. Um, however, like you say, there's still three days left. So we could be talking about that a little differently in a few days. I I don't really get all the talk, though, that Fremantle are too hard-nosed, being too greedy at the trade table um, because they did it with Weller and they did it last year with Neil. And at the end of the day, both times they got what they wanted. So why would they not take that approach again? I agree with you. And I think the commentary about Fremantle being unreasonable is a bit of a Vic bias kind of thing, as much as it is a dirty word to say Vic bias. Um, it is no different. It is no different to, say, to how Essendon's reacting to Joe Danaher um, yeah. requesting a trade. Absolutely no different. Brad Hill has no right to walk out on Fremantle with two years left on his contract. So yeah. they, Fremantle have every right to, to, you know, be staunch about it. You know, Brad Hill's probably a better player than Joe Danaher at the moment. So, of course, they, they should be, you know, asking yeah. for what they are. Just on that, I was going to leave it to a bit later, but what's uh, as the next question, what do you think is a fair price for Brad Hill and what is your predicted outcome in this situation? It is a it is a bit of a tough one now um, with 
with that pick swap uh, that's gone on. I can honestly see this way, this one going in a number of ways. I can see him staying at Fremantle. I could see, it's, it's hard for me to see Saints trading pick 12 and 18 to Fremantle um, and still getting the other business they want to do done. Honestly, I, I'm not actually too sure. My general feeling is that Brad Hill will be at the St Kilda Football Club, but you know, they, Fremantle should only do it if it's worth their while, and it's hard to see how they can make that happen, to be honest. Before we finish off, is there any other clubs that you think should be doing more in this trade period? I know it's kind of the same as what I said about has anyone done poorly, but is anyone really not doing much and you expect them to do more? Generally, I seem to look at the teams that aren't quite there, but are getting close. Teams like, you know, Essendon, you know, they're not doing much business, it seems like. Port Adelaide, doesn't seem like they're doing a, a lot of business, you know, and I think those those clubs, they have the potential to really push themselves into the eight if they made a few quality signings. Having said that, you know, again, there's still three days to go, Jesse, so could be sitting here on Thursday night and Bombers have landed, you know, Ollie Wines. Brad Hill and Josh Bruce for some reason and <laughs> we're, we're saying it's the, you know, A-plus trade period for them. Yeah, like you, I think Essendon, it does, like you make a good point there on the verge of the eight and, you know, trying to improve up the ladder um, but it seems like their whole strategy this offseason has been to hold on to Orazio Fantasia and Joe Danaher. Sydney as yeah. well are in a similar situation where obviously they're going for Danaher so it, yeah. it's hard to say they're not doing enough but realistically I think they're probably only going to lose Papley and probably not getting yeah. one in um, at least it, that's the way it seems to me. Adelaide are another club who, you know, there's talk about this mass exodus, lots of players being culled out of the club, but what return are they getting on it? Greenwood yeah. isn't going to get them much. Uh, Eddie Betts might get them a third or fourth rounder. Uh, Ellis Yolman's gone for free, basically. So, um, yeah. And the other one, this is a little bit of a harsh one, but I do kind of look at Collingwood where they sit. They have no first rounder this year. Um, yeah. And they're a little bit, they've got their hands tied a little bit, having traded in beams last year. They don't really have the salary mm. cap to really improve. They do look maybe like they need some freshness in the side, maybe, but then again, it's hard to be too critical of a side who just traded in beams and were just four points off a grand final. So um, I'm not really criticizing them as much, but maybe I'm sure they would wish they'd had more opportunities to get um, you know some players in this offseason. You know what? I think that's actually a really great call on uh, Collingwood. Sitting here right now, my opinion is that they're not as good as Richmond and West Coast. So they need to do something. Fair enough if they think they've got, you know, the cattle in the squad and they want to back the squad. But who knows? Maybe they're doing a few things behind the scenes. Wouldn't mind them trying to bring in a tall forward. Again, we you talk about Josh Bruce. I mean, someone like him, he he's a proven goal kicker in the AFL. So... You know, I, I'm not quite sure why they maybe wouldn't have a look at Josh Bruce yeah, and try and get him into Collingwood. Cool. Thank you for your time, Joycey. It has been a pleasure once again to discuss AFL Trade Period with you. Those watching who are new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe to the True Footy YouTube channel. We're going to do more content uh, post-trade period and also definitely on the draft. And I think uh, Bush and I will be getting together for a trade period deadline day live stream. Hopefully we get that working, no technical issues. And then we're going to do a podcast straight after trade period discussing it all. So um, thank you, Joycey, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Sounds good, mate. I'll see you next time.